All right, we have three conversation points on the table. Um, what is Kwame Ture's thesis in the text? Uh, what is your working definition of Pan-Africanism? And then uh, what new understandings of Pan-Africanism did you gain through engagement with this text? Uh, who would like to share what was discussed in your breakout rooms? Um, me. Okay. So I would like to discuss um, question number two. And in my group, it just, so it was a definition of Pan-Africanism and it's the principle or the advocate um, political union of all indigenous African or movement for the political union of all the African nations. Okay, absolutely. Thank you, Sela. Uh, Tanaya? Um, we discussed the both the definition and um a thesis okay uh, i'll just go with the thesis because that's the part that i contributed to but um from the text uh pan-africanism no the thesis that i got from the text in relation to pan-africanism was um i wish i would have screen recorded not screen recorded screenshot my comment but it was along the lines of um it is the separation from the idea that African that limits African people to the land that they are in, and it further educates the African people to understanding what their culture was prior to slavery. Thank you. I like the um, the conceptualization, and also you you provide us an analysis of the um, the text while giving us the thesis. So thank you tonight. Um, anyone else want to chime in as far as what was discussed in your breakout rooms? Okay. Um, so what I will do is I'll transition into my notes. Um, okay. Well, there you go. So the uh, speech that you guys read was pulled from this book uh, entitled Stokely Speaks um, from Black Power to Pan-Africanism, which is the title of the text that you've read. Um, Stokely Carmichael changed his name to Kwame Ture. Um, but before I get into the actual text, I would like to give you guys some insight into my personal um, relationship to Pan-Africanism. Um, and, and it's really twofold, right? One is from a uh, organizational standpoint and a, from a political standpoint and a, a movement standpoint. Uh, I want to say anywhere from like shit, seven to 10 years, I organized with an organization called the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, the three major figureheads to that organization were Kwame Ture, whose speech that we read, um, Kwame Nkrumah, who was the first independent president of Ghana, um, liberated Ghana in 1966, and Ahmed Sekou Ture, who was a president of independent Guinea, um, all of which were mentioned in Kwame's speech. As I mentioned, Stokely Carmichael changed his name from Stokely Carmichael to Kwame Ture to honor both Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Ture. So the three of them, um, as the story tells, as the story goes, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, is kind of kicked out of the United States because of his um, organizing efforts. Um, he's forced to travel abroad. In his travels abroad, he lands in Africa, spends some time in Ghana, and then spends some time in Guinea, where he meets both Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Ture. They come together and form the organization called the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, Kwame brings Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture brings the party back to the United States. Now, the thrust of the party is to organize and develop what they call the revolutionary intelligentsia, so the revolutionary thinking class, the revolutionary intellectual class. And they felt that the best way to do so is to reach out to the college campuses. That's how I got involved with the organization. Um, during this time, I was doing my undergrad at Cal State LA, and by and large, Cal State LA was the hub of the All African People's Revolutionary Party uh, for that five-year period. Um, annual programming, African Liberation Day was held on, our cam on Cal State LA's campus. Uh, we ran a, a series of movie nights that dealt with Pan-African Revolutionary Films, um, which was done on, Pan on Cal State LA's campus. The party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, they described Pan-Africanism as an objective. And the objective is the total liberation and unification of African people and Africa under scientific socialism. So all of their programming, all of their political education, all of their organizing efforts 
were to fulfill that objective, right? So that's from a, from a practical standpoint, that's from a boots on the ground organizing standpoint. From a theoretical standpoint, um, I received my bachelor's from Cal State LA in Pan-African Studies. I received my master's from Cal State LA in Pan-African Studies. I'm currently doing my PhD. It's in cultural studies, but my focus is on African studies. And my dissertation is on developing a Pan-African pedagogy. And pedagogy is just a, uh, a way of teaching. It's a teaching methodology. It's a uh, specified approach to teaching. So for me, I'm cultivating a Pan-African approach to teaching, um, which is structured in a lot of the things that's articulated in the speech. Um, a lot of the way that I engage um, you all in the classroom setting is grounded in this Pan-African pedagogy that I'm developing, right? So that's the theoretical um, Pan-Africanism that informs my life choices. And then finally, from a personal standpoint, right? I consider myself an African who was born here in the United States. Um, my wife, she's um, born in the United States also, but her parents migrated from Eritrea. So she has a very direct connection to the continent. So my children, right, they are very much brought up in a Pan-African home. Their cultural influence is informed by their grandparents who are directly from Eritrea, and then of course, black culture here in the Americas. So from all aspects of my life, Pan-Africanism has a very vast influence. Um, above my right shoulder here, that red, black, and green flag is the flag of Pan-Africanism, right? So not only is this something that we read about, right, but this has very practical implications in how we could live our everyday quotidian lives. So to get into the text, he starts off uh, with providing his working definition of Pan-Africanism. He says, Pan-Africanism is grounded in the belief that Africa is one. The artificial borders being the result of the Berlin Conference, where European powers carved up the continent and divided the spoils among themselves. Pan-Africanism is grounded in the belief that all African people, wherever we may be, are one, and as Dr. Nkrumah says, belong to the African nation. Our dispersal, and when you say when you hear dispersal, that just means the disbursement, right? African people being spread out. So our dispersal was the result of European imperialism and racism. Now, granted, Kwame Ture is one of my favorite ancestors of all time. Like I study Kwame, like deep study of Kwame. But here I have to disagree, right? He makes the claim that our dispersal, our separation is a result to European imperialism and racism. Now I'd like to counter that claim, right? Um, you know from being in my class that the first large-scale migration outside of Africa by African people could be traced back 200,000 years ago, right? Um, predating Europeans taking their stepping foot on the African continent. You also know from being in my class that Abu Bakr II, brother of Mansa Musa, traveled the Atlantic and landed in the Western Hemisphere 200 years, two centuries prior to Columbus. Right. So this right here historically situates African migration prior to European invasion, European colonization or European racism. OK, so this is the claim that I'm making. This is my argument. This is my critique of what Kwame is saying. All right. But then as we read further. Kwame is prodding us about how to understand and how to interpret African history. He says, the historical conditions must be seen in correct perspective. Pan-Africanists study the history of Africa and her people. African history is rarely recorded as the history of Africans. It is usually reported as an offshoot of European history. Consequently, when we have studied our history started, I'm sorry, when we have studied our history, the starting point has usually been the discovery of the Africans by the Europeans. Thus, our brothers and sisters in the Western Hemisphere begin our history with slavery, and on the continent, we begin with colonialism. And these two factors are not joined, okay? So what he's saying, that first of all, we need to have a correct understanding of history, right? And what happens for even Pan-Africanists, right? 
even for people who set Africa as the center and not on the peripheral, when they study African history, they start with what they call the discovery, when Europeans make contacts with Africans. And because this is the rags point, this is a starting point, right? African history on the, in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, starts with enslavement, right? African history on the continent starts with colonization. This is his claim. And he says that this is an incorrect point of analysis. He says, this incorrect analysis makes for incorrect solutions, right? So he's saying we cannot start our history with enslavement. We cannot start our history with um, colonization because that's an incorrect analysis which will make incorrect solutions to our problems. But check this though, what he's warning us against, he's doing with Pan-Africanism, right? So he's saying, we don't want to start our history with European contact. Let's go before that, right? But he traces the start of Pan-Africanism to European invasion, colonization, and racism. Do you guys see my point? So exactly what he's telling us not to do with our history, he's doing with the history of Pan-Africanism. That's why I say it's important to understand that Pan-Africanism did not start with European contact. It did not start with um, European invasion, European colonization. It starts with when African people choose to migrate outside of the continent. That's the start. That's the rags point of this notion or this idea of the diaspora. Okay. Um, he also contends that all African forms of resistance, whether they be conscious or subconscious, are African people moving towards Pan-Africanism. Uh, he also makes the claim that all African intellectual giants were baptized, as he calls it, by Pan-Africanism. Um, he says the W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Henry Sylvester Williams, Joseph Casey Hayford, George Padamore, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Patrice Lumumba, Malcolm X, Ben Bella, President Ahmed Sekou Touré and President Kwame Nkrumah are a few of the giants who all were baptized by Pan-Africanism. Uh, and then he does, the, uh, to me, it was a really phenomenal job um, and, and almost in passing of charting the evolutions, the ruptures, and the development and victories of Pan-Africanism. And, and I'll read a, a portion of this to kind of give you an idea. He is... So he says, um, today, even with nominal independence, minimal independence on our continent, Pan-Africanism finds fertile ground. When Casey Hayford was calling out to his brothers across the Atlantic, Ghana was the Gold Coast and Britain was her master. So what he's saying is when Casey Hayward from the Western Hemisphere, right, was calling for Pan-African unity across the Atlantic to Africa, Ghana was considered the Gold Coast. Ghana was being colonized by the, Brit by the British, right? But then check the evolution. Yet when Kwame Nkrumah stretched out his hands to his brothers across the Atlantic, Ghana was independent and Nkrumah was the leader, right? So there's a development there. So as um, Hayford is trying to reach out to Africa, Africa is being colonized by Britain. Right. But now as Kwame Nkrumah is trying to reach out to the Western Hemisphere, Africa, well, not Africa, Ghana has been liberated and Kwame Nkrumah is the president of Ghana. OK, development. When Marcus Garvey said that unless Africa is free, Africans the world over would not be free. He was answered by a counter revolutionary president, king of Liberia, who wanted no relations with his brothers. OK. So Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican who migrates to the United States to, and he organizes and builds one of the largest scale movements of African people in the Western Hemisphere. As he's calling for a Pan-African ideal, right? To connect with brothers and sisters across the Atlantic and Africa, the president of Liberia wants nothing to do with him. Now here's a, um, a tidbit, a historical tidbit that's important. During the time of reconstruction, this is post-enslavement and the conversations circling like how do we address or what do we do with these newly liberated African people? A contingent 
said, let's send them back to Africa. And a contingent of the newly liberated Africans said, let us go back to Africa. So government funds were provided and they set up a separate colony in Liberia, um, the north, northwestern part of the African continent. Um, but keep in mind, this is funded by United States interests. And this is funded with the idea of going to colonize Africa, right? Not with Europeans, but with black folks from America going back to colonize Africa. And he says the king of Liberia at that time wanted nothing to do with Marcus Garvey's movement, right? But check the evolution. But Brother Malcolm X addressed the organization of African unity. So Malcolm X, someone born in the United States, is able to travel across the Atlantic and he's able to address the organization of African unity, which is the conglomeration of all the African heads of state, right? Marcus Garvey never set foot on Africa and Brother Malcolm was treated like a shining African prince. Africans of the diaspora have been moving at a rapid pace towards Pan-Africanism, but very few people have analyzed that movement correctly. Brother Malcolm told us we need we needed black nationalism. So think back to um, the ballot or the bullet speech, right? Where he's advocating for this idea of black nationalism. Check out what Kwame does with this notion of black nationalism. So brother Malcolm told us we needed black nationalism, but black nationalism is African nationalism because the black man is the African and the African is the black man. Thus, brother Malcolm's black nationalism is really African nationalism. African nationalism finds its highest aspirations in Pan-Africanism. So what Kwame is saying is throughout that speech that Malcolm is talking, to, um, throughout that speech, the Ballad of the Bullet, when Malcolm is advocating for black nationalism, what he's really saying is Pan-Africanism. He just hasn't developed the language yet to call it Pan-Africanism, okay? Um, and then, you know, um, Kwame kind of separates himself from his contemporaries who are considered Pan-Africanists. He says, a lot of people of my time want to say it's not necessary for you to repatriate or to move back to Africa to be considered Pan-Africanists. But I get it, right? Like everyone may not have the opportunity, may not have the resources to do so, but we cannot, we cannot leave Africa itself, the continent, the landmass out of the equation. It has to be on the forefront of our organizing efforts. It has to be on the forefront of our consciousness. Remember the objective of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, right? The total liberation of Africa and African people, right? So Africa cannot be left out of the equation. And this is something that Kwame Ture is very serious about. Um, he, ends the, uh, he ends the speech for me with a, with a call to action um, and also a realistic optimism about the success of this Pan-African movement. He says, the Africans for the last 500, the African for the last 500 years has known neither peace nor justice. His wealth and his labor have built Western Europe and America. When these forces are harnessed for our benefit, the reconstruction of Mother Africa will be worthy of her glorious past. The setback in Ghana is no cause for dismay. So the setback in Ghana that he's speaking of, as I mentioned in 1966, Kwame Nkrumah is able to throw away British colonialism and liberate Ghana to become the first independent king of Ghana or president of Ghana. Um, I believe within a two-year time frame, um, between 67 and 68, um, Western powers are able to successfully initiate a coup d'etat, throwing Kwame Nkrumah off of the throne. He's forced to seek refuge in Guinea, um, and Sekou Toure brings him in. He gives him the refuge and he makes him co-president of Guinea. So this is the setback that Kwame's talking about. He's saying that there's no cause for dismay, right? He says, Pan-Africanists know that setbacks are not new to the African struggle. This one has not even been long. We are not afraid of the inevitable bloodshed, for beyond it, we see victory in the air. And for me, that's where the uh, realistic optimism comes into play, right? Um, I know there will be some bloodshed, but I know at the end of this bloodshed, victory is certain, right? And, and I'll, I'll put a pause on my um, notes there. Let's jump into our fishbowl. Um, I think the majority of you have should have two already, 
but I want to give the opportunity for those who do not to get your um, fishbowl in because it's like we may have one more fishbowl opportunity after today. So is there anyone um, who needs to fishbowl? Uh, you could talk about your breakout rooms, you could talk about your journal, or you could talk about the notes that I just delivered. Are there any volunteers? Uh, can, I, can I go? Yeah, absolutely, Kyle. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll call that random. Um, just let me know if you've gone twice already. Um, JR, have you gone twice for your fishbowl? Hey, Professor, can I go? Yeah, I got you, Margaret. Uh huh. Right. Go. Uh, wait, Professor, did you call me or? No, I called JR Jacobo. Because I believe you went twice, Jaden. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, James, I believe you went twice already. Correct me if I'm wrong, James. Yeah, I went twice. Thank you. Uh, Adam, have you gone twice? Adam, have you gone twice for your fishbowl? Yeah, I, I have. Thank you, Adam. Um, Jesse, have you gone twice for your fishbowl? Yeah. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Kaylin, have you gone twice for your fishbowl? Uh, yes, I have. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, Maribel, have you gone twice? Yes, I have. Thank you, Maribel. Uh, Monica, have you gone twice for your fishbowl? For twice, do you mean two times before the midterm and two times after the midterm? No, or two times. Oh, just, oh, yeah. Okay, then I went two times already, yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, Tanaya, have you gone twice? I want to say you have. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, Eric, how about you? Have you gone twice? Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Gisela, have you gone twice? Yes. Perfect. So we'll just go with um, Kyle and Margaret, and then uh, we'll go into classroom conversation after that. So whoever wants to start it off. Uh, in my breakout room, we just like talked about the, the definition of uh, Pan-African studies or Pan-Africanism as a whole. So uh, we talked about, uh, let me see, we did like the people, or from, when people were studying Pan-Africans, Pan-Africanism, African people realized that their culture and their roots were deeper than uh, imperialism and that uh, how they, the roots of Pan-Africanism was, it was a way for them to, for African people to separate their life from post con con Canal, uh, like, yeah, canalism. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then it's just like the. It's just for all like groups of all ethnic groups of African descent to like come together and like work together to get. I I would like to jump on that as well. I think I came a little late to class, but um, uh, I think that because Pan-Africanism, um, I guess what I want to say is how Africans were stripped a little bit from the, well, a lot from the culture. Um, in turn, I think it created uh, the, the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I think that although something beautiful happened out of that, it's just sad how um, like so much was lost in the process. I don't know if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Margaret. What you're saying is, um, although something beautiful was produced through this caus causality of the diaspora, through a um, system of enslavement, system of colonialism, yes, there's beauty in that that happening, but then there, there was also a tremendous amount lost. And, and for right. me, Margaret, it makes me think about Glissant, right? The abyss and, and, and the open boat. For me, that kind of speaks to what you're getting at. Absolutely. Yes, that's what I was trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, what I, I do want to do, because I, I know, Kyle, you slipped and you said Pan-African Studies, and that's not what you meant. But it kind of got me thinking. Because this is the Pan-African Studies Department, right? And I believe, shit, for California for show, we're the only department of Pan-African Studies in California for show, but it may even be the nation, right? So my question to you all, now that you have somewhat of an understanding of what Pan-Africanism is, what's the significance of Cal State LA having a Pan-African Studies Department 
instead of a black studies, instead of an African American studies, instead of an Africana studies, what's the significance of a pan African studies department? I think the significance of a pan African studies department is to be like dig deeper, you know, not just, you know, black culture, but in Africa in just alone. And then from that, you can you can learn so much about how black culture is today. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I would, oh, sorry, you can go. Uh, go ahead, Kyle. I was just saying it's like, uh, yeah, it, it digs deeper for like, it's just not like uh, African-Americans, it's like the descendants of like, or like the roots of like Africa as a whole, you know? Absolutely. All right, Jaden? Yeah, I was just going to add on because like a lot of Pan-Africanism is really just like the unification aspect. So I feel like in this case, it's more so just um, taking into account um, all Black people and then kind of putting that together and us kind of learning from each other and um, just, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking at the chat. Uh, tonight is saying it unifies all people with African descent while simultaneously educating those that don't understand African history. Yeah, I, I think you're all right. And, and something that um, Jaden was saying, it just provides for a more fecund level of analysis. When, when I say fecund, it just means like a rich and a, and a, and a deep uh, level of analysis, right? Because again, if it was just uh, African-American studies were demarcated within only Amer the Americas, right? And we're, we can't really engage Africa. We can't engage the Caribbean, right? But when you say Pan-African, that brings the Caribbean, that brings the continent, that brings Europe, that brings Asia into the conversation. There is an African presence in Asia, you know? And if you wanna dig deeper into that, there's a scholar by the name of Renoko Rashidi who does research just on how much Africanity there is in Asia, right? Um, so I, I completely agree. It just opens for a broader discussion on our perspective. Um, so let's open it up to further questions, comments about the reading. We also had the, um, you know, James, were you going to say something? Because I've seen your mic come off. I guess like a question to you, kind sure. of. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think you would agree with this, that more like uh, African people should learn learn Pan-African stuff, you know, uh, Great. Um, so kind of when you see athletes, uh, I, I know on the surface level, they criticize policing, you know, like, like they won't really go too deep into like the root problems. But do you find it kind of like weird or like hypocritical, like, um, like before the games, they'll, they'll be, uh, oh, thank you troops for your service, this and that. And then like, like there's so many military bases in Africa. Yeah, hell yeah. Um... Like, like, I don't think it's wrong. Like, I don't blame troops, you know. It's, it's more the government, if anything, you know. But I, I think it's kind of weird. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, James. Um, also, right, the um, this pseudo-patriotism that's in, in sports is kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, you're right. And then another thing I think about, I'm trying to think how to the best articulate this, it's certainly a contradiction. Um, but you have to understand too, athletes are paid a tremendous amount of money to, to push a line, right? Um, part of that line is patriotism. Part of that line is salute to service. Um, you see what happened to Colin Kaepernick when he became critical of police, policing and things of that nature. Um, I know for the NFL, it's like, I want to say billions of dollars invested and promoting things like salute for salute to service. Um, I believe the month of November in the NFL is Military Awareness Month. So if you watch the games closely, you'll see like the teams will have like camouflage and things like that. These are all money that's being paid to the NFL to do these things. Um, I want to say, shit, I could be wrong on the date, but I want to say before the year 2000, they weren't even showing the national anthems to start the games off, uh -huh. right? They pay yeah. to have that done, right? So yeah. it's a very close tie with the bag and this false notion of patriotism. Yeah, um, but I went to an NFL game maybe 
before the Rams came to LA, so I don't know when. But it was my first time. I, I'm not the biggest football fan. I'm more into basketball. But um, before the game, you would see the, um, you know, like the military jets, you know, fly over. And it's like, you know, everyone, like, you see it, you're like, oh, wow, you know, it's so cool. But then, you know, you take a deeper, you know, just a minute to think like, hey, this is probably going to go kill a family, you know, in a couple of weeks, yep. you know. But, uh, and, and, I, and I do think uh, when, like, ESPN promotes athletes, at, uh, athletes as um, social justice uh, figures, they, I, I think there's very few that are very, that, that are very good. Like, uh, like, even though I have a problem with, like, Kyrie Irving's, like, vaccine, I, I do think he's really smart yeah. uh, when it comes to that stuff. Uh, if you go, like, on his Instagram, he posts a lot of, like, um, African, uh, yeah. uh, you know, material. And um, and, and Muhammad Ali would probably be, like, you know, the because he actually criticized uh, the U.S. from within. Uh, ra- rather and like LeBron, like I guess like LeBron would be kind of the opposite, but he did really good with the school. But Le- like when it came to LeBron and uh, he, the whole China comments, you know, uh, specific. He he didn't have to weigh in, but he per- he chose to defend, you know, like slave labor. Yeah, you know. Also, who who's who's LeBron's biggest sponsor? Yeah, Nike. Yeah, and, and then that sucks because I I do think if Muhammad Ali was in that position, I I think he would have spoke up like, hey, you know, yeah, it's terrible what China's doing. Yeah, it's definitely a different time. Um, and yeah, like Muhammad Ali, he took an L, right? Like he lost a he lost his championship. I'm sorry, his title belt. Um, lost a tremendous amount of money. But I have to argue, right? Like I'm sure the amount of money that LeBron is making is vastly more than what Muhammad Ali is making. Oh yeah. And not to justify it. I'm not justifying what LeBron's doing. But that's going to make you think about shit a little bit differently. Because I believe his opening contract with Nike as, out of high school was 105 mil, right? Like, you're, you're 19 years old and you just got paid 100 and, um, 100, $105 million, right? And they're taking care of you for the past 25 years. It's going to be really hard to talk about them having slave labor camps. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Just, it's it's going to be hard to do. But again, not a justification because you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. looking, at the, looking at the chat, says so about uh, Tanaya saying it's about weird how certain sports are suddenly extremely patriotic when there's even though there's no correlation. Absolutely, um, it's usually the biggest platform for Black people to express ideas. The Olympics, yeah, um, and I don't know how many people watched this past Olympics, but China was very serious about not allowing any type of Black Lives Matter protests to take place in this year's uh, this past Olympics. So. Um, Sports are interesting, man. It's a very interesting platform because major- majority of athletes, especially in your major three sports, um, I believe football, basketball, it used to be baseball, not as much anymore um, as far as the black president presence, excuse me. Um, it's a weird space because it's, it's, these are sports that are major- overwhelmingly black, right? But you're not allowed to talk about concerns that really impact the black body. So it, it's a really a hotbed um, space. And I think, you know, Colin Kaepernick at this moment is the ideal figure to deal with when it comes to the intersection of race and sports. Um, also, there's, I believe, a brother named, um, it's probably before y'all time, in the NBA in the 90s, I want to say Sharif abdul Mohammed, I think it was, he actually, yeah. yeah, he got kicked out of the NBA because he would not, um, you know, do the, the Pledge of Allegiance. He was a Muslim brother and he would do his prayers at that time and the NBA got rid of him because of that. Uh, Jaden, you had your hand up? Yeah, because um, I wanted to say like too, like in some cases though, it's way like bigger than just sports. Like, and uh, this kind of also ties in because um, like, I don't know if you guys heard, but, um, or I don't know, maybe this has kind of been everywhere, but um, Virgil Abloh, um, for a lot of his time in the limelight, especially with Louis Vuitton in general, like he really pushed to be able to use more so like um, African style textiles and prints um, when it comes to a lot of the designs that he was making. And he got really criticized for that, especially because of um, Louis Vuitton's like really Eurocentric, um, I guess like white history. And for me, it's interesting because like 
and when I think about that and I think about like his loss and like us losing him, like it's it's wild to see him be able to bust open a door that a lot of black people such as myself didn't think was possible for us to be on that type of stage where we could um, kind of mix what is considered streetwear and street culture and high fashion and then at the same time make these you know executives from a predominantly and historically very white very eurocentric history i mean think of what black people go through in general when it comes to climbing up uh, the financial ladder in general right i mean bosses yada 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 like upper Achillean people, we have to work maybe twice to three times as hard just to get to that same position. But to think that someone of his caliber was able to not only get past basically what I'd consider like the old guard almost of that, but then at the same time to be able to express those ideas from a giant platform is that like it, it's, it, it kind of transcends just from sports. It's also in creativity and it's crazy how it's he basically made it possible for a lot of young black creators to be taken seriously, yeah. especially in um, fashion. And in a roundabout way too, like you know, as problematic as he is, you got to give Kanye his props because he kind of gave Virgil the platform to do what he did. You know what I mean? And Kanye kind of knocked a lot down a lot of those doors in fashion as well. Um, tonight, did you want to kind of put what you're saying in the chat? Put that out loud in, in our shared space. I was just saying, like, when it comes to being a patriot, I understand being a patriot because in every country, they're going to want people who have a platform to be in support of the country. I understand that. However, it's kind of like if you want the people to be more socially and politically aware and to better understand what they're voting for, to better understand the economy or to better understand just the way that society works and is shaped, it would be better to allow people who are in positions of power, people who are looked up to such as sports players to be able to pick a side in some cases, to be able to state their position on things because once someone's idol is, is becoming more aware of something, then that person will want to become more aware. They're going to do their own research, whether or not they agree with the particular football player or basketball player. It opens a field, it opens a playing field of being more mindful of what you're talking about because it's kind of strict, like restricted to if you're not a patriot, if you don't support what we want you to support, then you're done it more so silences free thinking and doesn't allow people to, you know, I think it takes a put for some people, it takes a push to learn more. And because their idols aren't allowed to have that push or have that influence on them, it kind of is restricting some people. I'm not saying like they don't have the, the information available. I'm saying some people are impressionable even as adults, even as they are growing, we think after, as you, after you get to a certain age, you're supposed to, if you want to know, you're going to go look for it yourself. But I think we need to understand that a lot of people are still very impressionable as in their 30s and 40s. And there's always room to learn more, but they just need that influence. They need that person that they look up to to say some things for them to have that like epiphany. Like, oh, maybe I should look more into the laws and the laws of the land and the history of these people, the history of my state, the history of the laws in this country and reevaluate my position and my standing on these things that I feel I should believe in. Yeah. I think um, I'll, I'll offer this and, and close it out because yeah, I want you guys to treat the songs, but um, athlete culture is very interesting and it's almost like you're rewarded for being dumb. Like somebody, I played football like to my mid twenties, early twenties, right? And it's like, and I found the more intelligent, the more critical I became, the more problems I was having with coaches, with just the institution of football itself. So they really want you to be uncultured, uncritical, and just uh, that idea of the dumb jock is promoted on you. 
right? Like when you go to um, these high these high D1 institutions, right? They're not telling you to take critical classes. It's like, yo, just get whatever you need to do to get yourself eligible so you can play, right? So they really encourage these uncritical, really dumbass athletes. And then it's like, we're gonna have y'all look up to them so that way you're not critical. So what Tanaya is saying, like, yo, it would be beneficial if they were to have the ability to take a side. The powers that be don't want that, and that's why they cultivate these really dumbass athletes. Um, so let's do this um, because we're, we're running out of time. I want to make sure that you guys choose your um, songs. Please, by a show of hands, um, uh, you can use your you can raise your hand on the reaction page. Um, let me know if you listen to the six songs and you know what song you want to select for your project. Okay, and I'm gonna just start going through. So only two of y'all listen to the song. Okay, three. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go through the those who have their hands raised up. And we'll, uh, Jesse, what song did you want to choose? The Mama by Kendrick Lamar. Mama by Kendrick Lamar. Okay, dot. All right. Um, Jaden, what song did you want? Oh, uh, I wanted Nas. Nas Project Window. Tonight, what song did you want? Uh, Tupac, White Man's World. Uh, Maria, what song did you want? Nina Simone. Nina Simone. Uh, Maribel, what song did you want? Um, also Nina Simone. Okay. So Maria and Maribel, make sure you guys exchange information so that way you can start working on your project, okay? Um, Kaylin, what song did you want? Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. Uh, Rhapsody? Yeah, Rhapsody, uh-huh. Good choice. Thank you. Uh, Adam, what song did you want? I'll do on uh, Nipsey. Nipsey. Face the world. Face the world. Cool. Um, Grisella, what's Grisella, what song did you want? Um, Tupac. All right. All right. So make sure you and tonight exchange information, okay? All right. Uh, JR, if your mic is not working, if you could put in the chat for me what song did you want? If you If it is working, you just tell me what song you're looking at. Okay, and then James, what song did I, did I get your song already? Uh, no, uh, I'll do Kendrick. Okay, Kendrick. So uh, make sure that you exchange information with Jesse. Cool. And I believe uh, who Jaden, right? Jaden, no, no, Jaden has Nas. Okay, so Jesse, make sure you exchange information with Jesse. Uh, who else did I miss? Um. Eric, what song were you looking at? Um, I was thinking of Kendrick's. Okay. So you and uh, James and Jesse, make sure you guys exchange information. Uh, JR, I'm still waiting on you, man. Is there anybody that I'm missing that has their song that you want to choose? Okay, JR, you're going to do Tupac. So, JR, make sure that you exchange information with Tanaya. And Gisela, you're also doing Tupac. Um, okay. So, Monica, do you have an idea? Does anything, does anything sound interesting to you? Yeah, can I do Nina Simone? Yep. Uh, Nina Simone. Uh, Kyle, is there any song that stands out for you? Uh, can I do the Kendrick song? Yep. So you're going to make sure you get uh, Jesse's information, um, James and Eric. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, that, Maria, I got you. Um, Maribel, I got you. I think that's everybody, right? Is anybody missing? Okay, I'm going to read down the list. Please pay attention because you want to know who. Oh shit, Margaret. Oh, she had to break out. Okay, I have to send Margaret an email. Um, so I have Kyle, Kendrick Lamar's mama. I have Jesse, Kendrick Lamar's mama. So make sure Kyle and Jesse exchange information. I have Jaden Nas Project Window, Tanaya Tupac White Man's World. I have Maria Nina Simone. 
have Maribel, Nina Simone. So Maribel and Maria, make sure you exchange information. I have Kaylin Rhapsody. I have Adam Nipsey Hustle. I have Gisela Tupac. So make sure um, Tanaya and Gisela exchange information. Um, I have James Mama. So make sure that um, Kyle, Jesse, James, and Eric, you exchange information. JR, you have Tupac, um, White Man's World with Tanaya and Gisela. And then Monica, I have Nina Simone for women. So Monica, Maribel, and Maria, please exchange information. Um, so one thing I, I do want to throw out there, um, Jaden, you're in a group by yourself. Um, Adam, you're in a group by yourself. And I believe Kaylin is in a group by, by, by themselves. Um, you guys can do the project on your own. Um, I would prefer you do it in a group. So it's up to you if you guys wanted to stay in the group by yourself or you guys, the three of you guys could form a group. It's totally up to you on how you want to proceed. So please let me know if you want to um, just do it solo or if you're looking to form a, a group with a different song. So um, Jaden, what, what do you want to do? You want to stay with uh, Nas? Uh, what are the other options? Um, so. You have Nas Project Window. You have uh, Nipsey Hussle's Face the World. Um, and then there's Rhapsody's um, Mary Lee is the song. Uh, yeah, can you get back to me? Let me think about it. Do, do me a favor. Email me um, and let me know what you want to do. Um, uh, that's good. And then, so, Kaylin, did you want to stay with Rhapsody or did you want to join another group? Um, I think I'll stay with Rhapsody. Okay. And then Adam, are you okay with Nipsey Hussle or you want to join another group? I'll join um, Tupac. Okay. So make sure you get Gisela, um, Tanaya, and uh, JR's information. All right. So All right. far as the presentation, I don't care how you do it. Um, I've seen students do a podcast. I've seen students do an actual song themselves. I've seen students do a poem. However you so choose to present the information, I'm okay with. All I ask is that you have a thesis of the song, you have an analysis of the song, you have the contemporary analysis of the song, and you have any questions that you want to pose to the class about the song, right? So just like you situate your journals, the same information should be in your presentation, okay? So however you guys so choose, I'm okay with it. With it. Just um, make sure you have those four components. For next week, this is our last week of course material. You'll read this poem, A Black Love Supreme. Um, there will be one more poem that I will send out via email. Um, I typically have a guest speaker for this, but I wasn't able to secure it. She's actually um, doing some teaching at Columbia University, so I couldn't get her in our class this year. Um, but read this, and there'll be one more poem, and we'll discuss that to close out the class. Um, the week after will be our presentations, and then the day of our final will be our presentations. So the last week that we meet as a class, we'll spend the whole day doing presentations. Whatever groups that does not finish, we'll come back and meet on the day of the final to do the, the presentations as well. Um, are there any questions for me?